Hello, all you friends and neighbors, you sisters and brothers, and you citizens of the world. Welcome to another edition of Heartland at Home. This one is for the week of March 20th, the Vernal Equinox. Today, we're glad to bring in a couple of people from the People's Budget Council of Chicago United for Equity, and Peg Dublin will be talking to us about the Vaccine Brigade. So all of you out there, be it on stream, be it on live radio, uh, however you get us, thanks for joining the conversation. And as we usually do, we like to start off with hearing something good from one of our hosts. And we'll start with Tom Clark today. Well, I'm grateful for the St. Patrick's Day sing-along with Katie Hogan's family and associated friends and neighbors who we haven't seen in over a year. In fact, the last time many of us were actually together in a room was for a St. Patrick's Day celebration. So it was a great, great gathering. Katie? Yeah, you know, what was fun about that was people got up and danced <laughs> at the end. It was <laughs> something was else. Incredible. I'm glad no one could hear the penny whistle I was playing. <laughs> Uh, my, good, my good thing this week, uh, uh, since I missed you guys last week, I, part of taking this show the week off was to get to visit my South Side relatives, hug all the nieces and nephews, including the brand new one. And uh, I got to do more of that on St. Patrick's Day with the Skokie Heineman. So I'm pretty blissed out by seeing family. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Michael? What's your good news? What's your good stuff? That's well, I'm happening? glad that everybody in our household has at least gotten one shot now. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, my son, Cadian, and his brother, Hal, who had planned to move a piano to the attic in the, up in the recording studio, have decided not to undertake that. And as a birthday gift to Cadian, uh, his mom, you, a few me, and a few others are chipping in to have professional movers bring this thing up some very skinny stairways <laughs> to the top of the house. Yeah, I've got my doubts if when they see that, they'll do it. But we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, that's all good news. Um, a couple <laughs> things. A, a good and a bad. Here we got the good news and bad news. The Catholic Church decided not to bless gay marriage. Uh, it was know, part of a new marketing great. campaign they released last week. That's going to bring a lot of new people into the church. Yeah, but simultaneously comes the news that the Jesuits pledged $100 million to atone for slave labor and sales that they were involved in. And that represents the largest such effort by the Roman Catholic Church and comes, of course, amid growing calls for reparations across the United States. So good and bad side by side. It's part of the dichotomy some of us have lived with for all of our lives. That's right. Uh, the good and the bad of this uh, huge institution. Uh, following up on other news, uh, things continue to deteriorate in Myanmar. We're now close to 200 people have been killed by the military uh, uh, trying to stop protesters from uh, supporting the pro-democracy forces and upholding the election that took place at the military coup um, throughout. There are new rumors of uh, targeted uh, union leaders being uh, locked up, and there's increasing evidence that China may have a role behind the scenes. So it's a really dangerous situation in an all, 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 all the time tinderbox kind of thing in Southeast Asia. We ought to be paying more attention to it. And this is an important for your information. Remember this and share this information. The 50 senators who caucus with the Democrats represent 41 and a half million more Americans than the 50 Republican senators do. 41.5 million more Americans are represented by the Democrats than the Republicans in that Senate where they're talking about the filibuster and making uh, Moscow Mitch's head blow up every time they do. Yeah. He that, got that, heavy, he, he, uh, he criticized like scorched earth if, if they go after the filibuster. And I think Biden came back and uh, said he was certainly open to bringing some, changing some form of the filibuster. So it's, uh, it's amping up. I think one of the biggest steps we could take towards reparations is getting rid of the filibuster, which is a remnant of Jim Crow and all the things that happened 
after the war between the states that we are still fighting. So maybe yeah. it's time for it to end. Yeah, and if you haven't seen it, uh, check out Senator Warnock's first speech on the floor of the Senate. It's, it's on Facebook, look it up, 20 minutes. Okay, staying with the South for a minute. Jackson, Mississippi residents have been without water for a month. That's without water, folks. Now, they haven't received the kind of coverage that Texas did when they started at that same time not having water. And their water has, Texans water is slowly coming back. Not all the way. But uh, Mississippi doesn't have that coverage. And they need help. Maybe we should ask AOC if she could start a fundraiser for Mississippi, like the one that she did for Texas, raising, I don't know, $5 million or more dollars. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look on the labor front. And uh, it's really nice to know that the food service workers at Loyola, our neighbor here, uh, got a new contract, which includes a raise, additional paid sick leave, and a bunch more. And union workers at Jewel Food Stores here in Chicago um, increasingly seen as frontline workers, just got a new five-year contract after they threatened a strike. And going back down south over in Bessemer, Alabama, the voting is on to unionize the Amazon plant there, and we will keep you posted on the results. The man, the, the, it means a lot. If, if we win that election, you're going to see a lot more voter, um, excuse me, uh, labor organizing efforts underway. More locally, there's been organizing going on in a distribution facility uh, run by Amazon in the Pilsen neighborhood. Uh, it's a very different effort because it's not used national uh, union organizers. Um, in fact, it's sort of anti-bureaucratic -bureau union in its approach. They have won some pretty significant worker protections, including additional PPE equipment. And... Um, one of the problems is there are rumors now that Amazon might close down that plant because of all the worker activity. So even close to home, this growth of Amazon distribution centers, while it pays well, also has serious work condition issues that workers are now organizing against. It will be important to keep uh, your attention on that one. So the other thing we, we like to follow up on issues that we brought up before. Last week, we talked about the weight shellacking that women have taken in economics wise since the pandemic, losing jobs, uh, being forced to back into roles at home that they had won freedom from. Uh, one of the solutions I ran across this week was our own local uh, Chicago Women in Trades, uh, a very favorite group of mine. Um, they have basically organized to ask for support um, for the upcoming jobs in, from the infrastructure part of the, uh, what's the big stimulus bill package. that we just passed? What? We passed the stimulus package. Now they're going to work on an infrastructure bill. Right. The stimulus, well, the stimulus package actually includes some things. And um, yeah, and so that their women in trades is basically saying this is one way that we can uh, get our sisters back to work. And um, they have a great piece on it. Um, look under Chicago Women in Trades National Center for Women's Equ Equity in Apprenticeship and Employment. And in one other, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Katie, and one other follow up before we go to some music and our first guest. Um, while the hunger strike has ended, there's news this week that the folks in the 10th Ward who are protesting the sighting of yet another polluter um, have gotten. Um, a bit of relief from the city because they've delayed the decision on the operating permit. This right. is a significant victory. We don't know what the final outcome would be, but clearly the scrap metal recycling plant, uh, which has already started building a new facility, may have trouble getting its operating permit because of the issues around pollution that have been raised by residents of the 10th Ward. Congratulations. In Lincoln Park. Yeah, good work on raising the issue, everybody. We thought we'd have a little musical interlude with one of our favorite groups, Los Lobos. Sit back and enjoy before we start talking about the people's budget.
We want to welcome to Heartland at Home some members of Chicago United for Equity. Paula Serrano and Adam Slade both worked on the People's Budget Council this past year. And so we're going to talk a little bit about city budget. And Paula, why don't you start? What is Chicago United for Equity? What do you do? Well, Chicago United, for, thank you, Tom. We're, we're real excited to be here. Um, I, as many uh, affiliates and, and folks really uh, connected with Chicago United for Equity, I am also the founder of Borderless Studio, which is my uh, main practice. It's an urban design and, re and research um, uh, practice. Um, I'm a designer by training. I'm an, uh, I, I'm an architectural and, and an urban designer. So that's that's also a very interesting part about, about Q, about Chicago and equity that brings together folks from, from different disciplines um, to work in, in civic impact projects. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a senior fellow with Q um, and um, been working and collaborating projects since um, 2019. So um, the way that uh, Q works is, um, we focus on how do we build the Chicago that works for all of us, right? That that our race, that our geography doesn't determine our um, life expectancy or quality of life. And that is um, inherently related to how resources are distributed, what are the policies, how community power um, it's, it's, it exists within our neighborhoods and in our structures. So um, most of our work um, focuses on, on racial equity because of, of, of that reason, trying to understand, identify the inequities that have perpetuated, uh, that have been perpetuated uh, through um, racist policies, through um, disinvestment policies, and try to think collectively, try to imagine what are other ways that we can design our processes um, for, um, leveraging the voices of, of community and specifically our most impacted communities. Ada, would you add anything to Q's um, description of what we do? I think you gave a very uh, comprehensive answer. I think that Chicago United Equity's main mission is to uh, re reimagine a city where race equity is the center of decision making and power and investment. Uh, just, just very broadly in whatever ways uh, that shows up and impacts community. So, Adam, how did the People's Budget Council get in there? How did that become a tool to improve equity in distribution of resources? Well, one of the main pushes that we've had in our fight toward racial equity in the city of Chicago is to reimagine that city future where we are investing equitably across all neighborhoods of the city. And that requires a systemic review of how we make decisions. And so figuring out from a local community perspective, what we need in the city to be safe and thriving uh, in, in all of our communities, in our own ways, in our own needs, in our own traditions, uh, really spoke to a lot of the partner organizations and participants in the Q community. And so we decided to reimagine a new city. I would also add this, this is an idea of like people's budget Chicago um, started with uh, a, the previous year Q worked very strongly in a project called vote equity. And during mayoral um, elections, we um, wanted to rethink like what are, what are the priorities of the people not invented by candidates, but in their specific campaigns, but what could be a good roundup of, of ideas uh, and what are the topics, what are the themes, and what are the priorities? So vote equity during 2019 was that very strong, 1819, uh, was a very strong process to, to engage community. Um, so thousands of ideas were submitted. Uh, they were analyzed, they were um, synthesized, and there are priorities that were projected out of that that were reflected um, to inform um, like the people's ballot, right? Like this is what, what in comparison, what, what mayoral candidates were saying, like how does that fit and contrast and compare with the priorities of people? So that was a very strong framework for the people's budget. Like if you already have the ideas, if people are telling you, these are the things that matter the most to us and we would like to see investment on those, then how does that translate, translate into money? Um, I thought it was an important, important background for that. How did you go about engaging community members identified as a result of historic disinvestment by the city during this pandemic? 
Yeah, Anna, I, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I'll take that one. Uh, for this first year, we uh, really wanted to identify, as you said, key communities. And so what we did was we adopted 29 indicators from the Child Opportunity Index to figure out where uh, inequities were most impacting community areas. And we took the top 15 communities based on that criteria that we developed and designed a process to center and capture the needs of those people that are impacted. Uh, and in doing so, we just identified those communities and then we went into communities with the great engagement design of Paula, and she can describe that in a second, uh, just asking the main question, what do our communities need to be safe and thriving? And we broke that down into six categories, uh, one being health, one education, housing, infrastructure, community resources, and the carceral system, which addresses police and police accountability. Paula, do you want to talk about the engagement and the, and the great way that we went into communities? Right, so this was in the middle of 2020. Uh, we all saw the challenges of being gathering in person, uh, but we, we, did, we, we did understand that was important. It was important to have conversations that would allow us to go through this exercise. So the exercise was a, what is a methodology that is not new. Uh, it's called a participatory budget, the penny budget exercise, basically. Everyone understands in general how, um, you know, how to make a budget for their households. So we all understand how to allocate our money and priorities. But when we're given the framework on the six topics that um, Adam described, like then how would you allocate those funds, right? According to the things that you want to see thrive um, in your community. And uh, so we designed this uh, to be both digital uh, we understood we, we would have limited capacity to do this in person specifically, uh, gathering uh, safely in small groups in neighborhoods. Um, we, we, we went on a bus tour. So we designed this to be analog in person and we designed this to be digital. Two tools were, um, two methodologies were developed. One through uh, an interactive tool through the website. Um, I think a lot of um, participatory budget exercise are about surveys. Um, and we designed a tool, an interactive tool, where you could see the allocation of funds that, that every individual made. Um, but then they will look how then it compares with the city priorities. So it was a very interesting like bar hmm. comparison exercise. And then the third step was compared to uh, what individuals, what the city and what everyone has said. So it was really interesting to think from you know, the individual perspective, like what are my priorities for my community and then see what the city had allocated and then see what everything else. So it's also an exercise that it's aiming to shift a mindset around like collective decision-making, right? Not thinking necessarily about our needs, particular needs, but start to expand the mindset of like, what do we need as communities to thrive? Um, the in-person on the other hand, uh, it was a similar methodology, but we had to, um, we had to limit um, our in-person gatherings to 10 people. So we took a bus around the city, <laughs> took a bus tour um, and bring our tools, our board, our, um, our pennies um, and, and, and engage in a conversation that was like three, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was outlined by three parts. The first one was about reflection and it goes back to the question that Adam uh, mentioned. Uh, we wanted people to reflect beyond need but it really start to imagine what it's what do we need to thrive as communities so the first part was more of a reflection a collective reflection on that on that question like what do our communities need to be safe and thriving um, the second part was actually the allocation of, of budgets uh, and resources to each one of the um, different different categories there was a really interesting aha moment when people, you know, obviously you can anticipate what some of those responses were. A lot of people wanted to see money in housing and community resources and programs for seniors, for youth and health. Actually health was one of the top um, options. But then once they saw their allocation as a group, um, also seeing what the reveal moment of like, well, now you all know what you want. Do you wanna know what the, what the city is allocating? So that reveal moment of contrast and comparing I feel a lot of folks knew it, but seeing it and, and, and just confronting that information where a lot of the budget that is controlled by city council gets allocated into uh, police and policing our, our car cartel system was definitely um, still a very um, like shocking moment for a lot of folks. 
Um, so there was a little bit of uh, like education. It was a little bit of reflection at the end. Uh, one of the big asks, and Adam, maybe you can chime in this one. The third part of the workshops was, um, what do we do? Yeah, sure. Um, after the engagement and, and the community groups came to their penny budgets, we asked them to contact their older persons. So uh, they went directly to their representatives and shared their concerns and their findings from the discussion to advocate on their behalf. So all of the budget council members lifted up the voice of their community so that their older persons heard their concerns directly. Do you think, that, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, that, that also was a moment of, you know, designating a budget rep, right? Like that, that those group, that group of around 10 people would say, we want, we want this person to follow up uh, with all their people. So there was, there was a lot of kind of organizing with um, information um, and representatives for, from each one of those tables became uh, part of the, the council, the People's Budget Council. Uh, let me ask, do you think that the city council or specific aldermen or alder women or the mayor heard your concerns? I do. I think uh, in the midst of such a contentious budget season, uh, the budget process have, has evolved into a much more nuanced discussion among elected officials than it has in the past. But we definitely even heard in the uh, in the vote for the final budget the words "the people's budget" uh, from several older persons. So we know that they had the people's budget project in mind as they were considering their votes, and uh, we know that several different older persons engaged in conversations with uh, people's budget community representatives as well as uh, different participants and senior fellows from Chicago United for Equity. So. We know that they heard us and several of our partner organizations and supporters have been in community meetings as well, directly with older persons. So we know that the message is out there, even though it was uh, constrained by the virtual environment of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. That sounds excellent that you got the word into the organization, um, into the institution. What else does your research suggest that there might about equitable, more equitable ways to resource city operations, for example. Yeah, sure. From what we heard from our communities, uh, they really wanted to see major shifts in police spending in health and housing specifically. Uh, healthcare, obviously because of COVID, but a lot of the, the uh, variables that impact the health of communities were revealed uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so there's a real challenge in, uh, in targeting services because there's also not only the city, but the county and the state that invest in health services. And so figuring out uh, how to better design operations to meet community and public health needs uh, is something that uh, the city I know is working on and trying to figure out themselves in a changing world. Uh, additionally, with the the George Floyd protests and, and some of the community riots and a lot of the protests that occurred across the city, rethinking what public safety means in this city uh, is, a, is a really big conversation as well. Uh, over half of the city budget is allocated toward uh, police, uh, the operational budget. And so thinking about how we can make our communities safer and not just relying on police to do everything under the public safety umbrella uh, is definitely a conversation that needs to be had now and in a post-pandemic society and world. And then finally, um, thinking about the impact of housing stability after we emerge from this pandemic and eviction moratoriums are lifted, how are we going to make sure people are safe and, and housed uh, is definitely a real challenge. And, and as the economy shifts to our post-pandemic reality, what resources are going to be needed by our Department of Housing and our public housing agencies. Uh, that'll be a, another coordination challenge and a, and a pretty, pretty heavy lift for a lot of communities. Paula, do you have anything to add? I would just say it, it, we, we are you know, very invested in just raising you know, this priorities, especially with federal funding coming to our city. Um, you know, the CARES Act, we learned that was allocated mostly into um, like police and policing, um, necess not necessarily being the top priority during pandemic. Um, so we wanna you know, keep continue to um, 
raise those priorities in a much more visible, more strategic way, um, making sure that the next federal um, funding allocation by the Biden administration that is coming to Chicago goes into the things that are um, going to impact positively our, our recovery or the recovery of the communities that um, have been most impacted. So, you know, how do we, how do we more, how are we more responsive to allocation of resources? Boy, we are so glad that you are there. Um, how do people, if they want to know more about Q, Chicago United for Equity or the People's Budget, where should they go? And then I'm gonna follow up with the question because I know that you both will talk and I might not get a chance. Um, in what way should we not return to normal once people have gotten their vaccines? You know, we're, we're a little intent on, on that with this show. So two things, how people get, find you and uh, your suggestions on how we should not return to normal. Thank you. I can't answer the first one, Adam. You want to take the second one? Uh, well, we have uh, obviously websites, uh, Chicago United for Equity.org, People's Budget Chicago.com. Those are the two websites where you can uh, sign for updates, um, stay connected. Obviously, we're, we're also in social media platforms, um, just tracking also other. So we have we have definitely, uh, we, we try our best to keep folks updated through both social media platforms for People's Budget and, and, and Chicago for Equity. So those are the two. Thank you. Yes, and you know, how should we not return to normal? We need to take the lessons learned from COVID as well as inform our government operations and our politics with a view of our racial history from America, really rethinking how redlining, history of disinvestment, uh, police brutality, and uh, the elevated needs of different community areas over others can be changed so that this is a city that works for all of us really imagining a new world, a new city where all of us are one community and our specific needs are accommodated and invested in. And just so we can all have smiling faces and sing Kumbaya, but also respect <laughs> our own differences and our own needs uh, as all residents of the city. Amen. Nice. Thank you Paul for having Kimmel, us. Adam Slade of Chicago United for Equity. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us a sense of how one plans a people's budget during a pandemic. Really wonderful work. Um, looking forward to the next round and, and good luck Thank to you, you all. all. Thank you very much. Thank you. that music. Beautiful. Thank you for turning me on to him. Our, our guest, Peg Dublin, is uh, the person, we always ask our guests what music they're listening to. So what you just heard and what you heard, we will hear when we finish with Peg is her choice, which was Omar Sosa, a Cuban jazz pianist who has incredible music online. Chops. Peg Dublin, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with my friends. <laughs> Um, Peg knows every, all the faces here for uh, many reasons for a long, long time, but the reason we invited her now is she is the founder or possibly co-founder of a month-old uh, organization called uh, Vaccine Brigade, which we did tell you about on this show about three weeks ago. We 
announced it and said that it was happening and re hopefully recruiting nurses and retired nurses to help with the uh, with the effort. So you have now in one month close to what 90 volunteer names, half of whom have already actively helped getting shots in arms around Chicago. Wow, Peg. Yeah. Tell, yeah, tell I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, it just speaks to the incredible desire that people have to help out. I think the pandemic, um, you know, brought out this this need in people to be part of the solution. And um, I think what we did with the brigade is just provide a place for people to connect with and to find ways to be involved. And I, I think it started a year ago when the pandemic started and I'm a public health nurse and I saw the public health catastrophe looming and you know, right away at the very beginning, I wanted to be part of the effort, um, whether it was contact tracing or public health messaging. And I tried, I tried by myself to get involved through the city, the state. I got put on lists um, and nothing ever happened. And then finally in December, January, I realized, you know what, if I just wait, probably nothing is gonna happen but what if I organize this myself? So I just wrote to seven friends, all retired nurses and said, do you wanna help with this? Maybe together something can happen. So in January, I wrote the email and within days I had, I think five or, or six people said yes. And then they told their friends and were, it, it was like a fire that um, caught and Within weeks, we went from six or seven to 25 to 50 to 75. And this week we're at 90 and we'll be at a hundred by the end of this week. Mm -hmm. And we recruit both people who can vaccinate and other people who wanna help on the ground or with phone calls because there's plenty to do. And in the process, um, that to many of the efforts throughout the city. And we formed precisely to reach communities that were hardest hit by COVID. We saw the deaths, we saw the illness um, very unfairly distributed once again in community color and wanted to be part of the solution. So we're, we have a very special focus and mission to increase capacity in those communities to help organizations that are addressing this who may just need extra help their volunteers to help on the ground or giving the vaccine or um, people who want to do things from their home and so we've been connected to something called protect chicago plus which is the city's um response to the racial disparities around COVID targeting uh, 15 community areas and um, where every week or every weekend there's a big mass uh, initiative to reach those communities. So we're connected now with three of those communities, Belmont, Cragen, Austin, and Englewood and hope to be involved with, with more. And uh, word spread about the vaccine brigade, and we get requests from lots of organizations now to either help make phone calls. And just to give you an example, we got a we got a request yesterday or the day before. They needed help with a thousand phone calls to something called the Compassionate Care Network, and we had fourteen people sign up yesterday morning and make all the phone calls. So it, we, we just, and now we're, we're multi-generational. We have, we have a, you know, maybe a quarter of us are healthcare professionals that can give the vaccine. Uh, and then the rest are people young and, and older who just want to be part of this historical um, period of our lives with the pandemic. So that's just a little brief uh, 
introduction. I'm curious where you're getting your vaccine supplies from. So we don't have our own vaccine supply. We just help other initiatives. So for example, Chicago Protect, Protect Chicago Plus, that's connected to the city and they have the vaccine. They partner with healthcare organizations, community-based organizations. Um, so like Inglewood is partnering with um, Mile Square as the healthcare organization and about 20, 25 community-based organizations. So we just help out. We just say, we're here to help you. What do you need? So for Englewood, we helped with data entry. Um, in Austin, we're not, so that is with Rush and Lareda Hospital. They don't need help with vaccinations. They need help with on the ground operations. So we, they need 60 volunteers every weekend day. And I think we supply a lot of those volunteers to help with logistics. And with Belmont Craig, and they mainly need vaccinators. So every weekend, uh, somewhere between three and six of us are there every weekend giving shots in arms. So whatever they need, we're just there to help. Uh, can you <clears throat> share again the neighborhoods you're working in, just so I refresh my memory? <laughs> So we're, while we're partnering wherever we're asked, um, we work with something called the Vaccine Core Partnership, which is a partnership of about a hundred organizations and healthcare institutions. And so we're, we, are, we are on those calls every week and that's often how we hear of organizations that need help. Right now we're in Belmont Cragen until April 4th. We're in Englewood, until April 23rd, I think, in Austin, about the same amount of time. But we're also now involved with a, a Cook County-wide, uh, uh, it's called Age Option, which is an advocacy organization for seniors. They're setting up clinics in very hard hit neighborhoods for very frail elderly. So in the South suburbs, um, in the Western suburbs, um, so we, we go anywhere. Uh, we don't have particular areas. We may be volunteering um, with Erie Family Health Center, possibly with Heartland Health Center. Um, we don't have a particular neighborhood, but our mission is the hard hit communities. Um, Thank Dublin. Uh, I was gonna ask about the United Center, Peg. Um, uh, virtually uh, no vaccine has been wasted, said uh, Dr. Arawadi yesterday. Um, yeah. Uh, because she was getting some unwarranted un, uh, criticism. Um, I understand that they're booking 5,700 appointments per day at United Center. D is anybody from the vaccine brigade on duty out there? So um, the United Center um, listed uh, that they wanted help with non with non vaccinated people, we posted it on our on our list, and within a few days, I guess they got as many volunteers as they needed, and now it's off again. So um, things change quickly. We hear about things, and then the next day or two days later, it changes again. Right now, I don't know if any of our people signed up there. I think they did, um, but right now there's no more opportunities for volunteers there. But there's always plenty of need somewhere. Peg Dublin, all of us uh, have known each other, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for a while. Uh, you and I go way back to Redcoat Road. I'm kind of curious to know how your earlier work um, as a radical revolutionary influences your work today. Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think, you know, the theme of my life is around um, trying to repair injustice, however it, it is displayed. Um, and I became a nurse 40 years ago and worked in community health. And there I feel like I combined my um, quest for justice um, with healthcare justice. 
and and then I became um, involved with public health, public and community health. So this is just one more aspect of healthcare justice and is justice for people um, who are unfairly uh, affected by this pandemic. I feel like it's all in the same continuum around social justice. And before we let you go, Peg, um, this was a question I had when I joined the meeting the other night. There, there are ending dates, and you just repeated them, um, ending dates for certain of the neighborhood uh, vaccination uh, stops. And I'm wondering why are there ending dates and, or explain to people uh, that there might not actually be ending dates. Am I correct when I so, say that? Yeah, this is for the Protect Chicago Plus. They, their goal was to hit 10% of the population in each of these 15 communities. And they had X amount of supplies. Uh, so to hit generally around 8,000 people in a community area Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's four. I'm not sure of the exact number. So um, I do know that some of the, the effort to try to extend them, but, um, and I'm not that, I really can't answer that question why they're for six or eight weeks, um, but I think it has to do with supply and, and the goal of, of that initiative. Whereas the need will continue until everyone is vaccinated. Yeah. Um, I did want to put a plug in for our brigade. If anybody listening wants to uh, enlist our volunteers or join us, we have a Gmail account and it's vaccinebrigade at gmail.com. And we're creating our own logo and, and a Facebook page. So stay tuned for that. But we welcome um, requests for our volunteers. So we're made up of nurses, dentists, doctors, administrators, educators, outreach workers. Our age range is like 20 to 80, hmm. maybe older. And, um, you know, we're, we're really just there to help out. One, and, and, you know, one last question, which we are asking a lot of people at this point in time, and we're very interested in, um, you know, picturing a new world. In what ways should we not return to normal after we all get vaccinated and the world opens up again? Well, I think the pandemic has just magnified the, the social ills. And so one of them is pandemic has showed us that we need uh, universal health care for all. Um, this private healthcare system that's fragmented and uncoordinated does not work. And so I think, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for us to reform our society so that there is universal health care, universal uh, increasing the minimum wage, universal access to housing and and um, better working conditions and more attention to essential workers. Um, all of those things that have been magnified during the pandemic, you know, have been pointed out to the population as a well, whole that we need more infrastructure for public health, community health, um, democracy. Um, all of the social ills that we have known forever were just heightened during the pandemic. And so we need to pay attention to that and fight for those things, continue to fight for those things and for leaders who will attend to those things. So that's Amen what I would that. say. Amen to that, Peg Dublin. And thank you to the Vaccine Brigade for your work and everybody, vaccinebrigade at gmail.com, go for it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, that was more Omar Sosa as we uh, finished with uh, the Vaccine Brigade. What a wonderful example of community mutual aid. I, I love it, I love it. Indeed. Uh, now, just on our little calendar of events, today and next Saturday, two Saturdays in a row, the Triangle Park Community Orchard Fruit Tree uh, Maintenance is going to happen. Sorry, that, I said that wrong. The Chicago Park District is helping show us how to do fruit tree maintenance. We have the only community orchard in the city on city land, and that's at Triangle Park, 1750 West Juneway Terrace. And it's happening today, Saturday at 11 a.m. and next Saturday at 11 a.m. Learn how to help keep the trees going. In a somewhat related uh, manner, Home to Market Act is a new piece of legislation coming out of the General Assembly. Our friend Will Gazzardi is sponsoring it. It's coming up this month and our legislators should hear about our interest in supporting farmers, home bakers, artisan food makers, and women-owned businesses who benefit from this farm to home movement that is growing again. Home to Market Act, um, pay attention to it, let your legislators know about it. Um, the Wild Onion Market Food Co-op, um, that's the neighborhood food co-op that's been building um, under some great leadership for the last couple of years. They now have over 700 members and they are looking for space. So I could think of a couple of stores I'd like to see go away. No. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, like, I don't know, that Uber space on Morse Avenue where nothing Ooh. but garbage is happening. Um, Maybe in the new out. building where they're building the new, where at the Heartland site, they're putting up a new building. Maybe they could take over the first floor. I don't think that was in the design plan necessarily. Yeah. But pay attention to the Wild Art Onion Market uh, publicity because they put out a great list this week of their members who are also businesses. Great places for you to go and shop. It's a pretty long list. And uh, it's a very impressive list that they've gathered that kind of membership along with individual family households. So um, support Wild Onion Market. It's look, it getting closer to being a reality. In the last couple of weeks, there have been a number of uh, memorial moments, um, particularly with um, the victims of COVID in mind, um, candle lightings and moments of silence. So we usually do try and mention when somebody we know and love has been lost. This week, I just wanna call out one of my favorite actors always was Yafet Kato, who made it to 81 years old, brilliant, beautiful African-American man who played Lieutenant Giardello, maybe you remember, in Homicide, Life on the Streets, which was a very progressive cop show, um, if you ever, and also in one of my favorite films with Richard Pryor and uh, that white guy whose name I forget, <laughs> called Blue Collar, which when I was in Peru, it was the only movie playing in the only movie theater in Puno, Peru on Lake Titicaca. I saw it three times in 10 days. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Well, on this, going, yeah. on this vernal equinox weekend, um, with the weather warming up again in our crazy Chicago spring, we thought it'd be good to encourage everyone to get outside with a little music about being outside by Cozy Sheridan. And for over 25 years, we have brought you live from the Heartland, which is now Heartland at Home. We broadcast every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Central uh, at WLUW 88.7 FM. It also streams live from WLUW.org. And we are archived on our channel at youtube.com slash Heartland Media. And Cablecast, all week long on Can TV Channel 27. Thanks especially to our editor slash engineer, quote unquote, intern, Luis Mejia, and our marvelous music producer, Lynn Orman Weiss. Do Please, good do good in the, the world. world. The world needs all the good that we do. All, all power, power to the people. people.